comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come! Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore.
We continue to face ecological crisis as species are going extinct at an unprecedented rate. We live in the midst of wars and rumors of wars. And still today, we find ourselves waiting for these promises of God to be fulfilled. What promises am I talking about? What promises of peace on earth and goodwill toward one another? I mean, look at this prophecy from the prophet Isaiah, from the second chapter that I just read to you a moment ago. The prophet Isaiah received and recorded a vision of what God's salvation would look like. And boy, that sounded wonderful, didn't it? All the nations of the world cooperating, working together towards moral purposes. Swords and spears and instruments of war melted down to make plows and pruning hooks and tools to use to feed the hungry people of the world. Nations at peace with one another. A peace that lasts for so long that nobody even bothers to study war anymore. That sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't that dream of peace sound like something that we are all still awaiting, expecting, yearning for? And so in that sense, the season of Advent, it makes sense to us. We are still yearning for the promise of peace on earth to be fulfilled. We are still praying, just like they did 2,000 years ago, that at some point God would just step into the world and straighten everything out and set everything right. Which is why, in another sense, the season of Advent doesn't make any sense at all. Because, of course... In four weeks' time, the season of Advent will be over, and we'll be celebrating Christmas. We'll be celebrating the coming of that Savior, that Messiah, who it was prophesied would usher in the kingdom of God, who would bring peace to earth and goodwill toward mankind, right? That's what the angels sang. Peace on earth and goodwill to all human beings. It was prophesied that the Messiah would usher in that peaceable kingdom in which nation would not fight against nation and no one would study war anymore. In which all the weapons of war would be turned into the tools of peace and prosperity. We will be celebrating the coming of that Savior in just four weeks' time. But the thing is, I do not expect that in five weeks' time, peace is going to reign over all the earth. I don't think that five weeks from today, all of the world's guns are going to be melted down to make farm equipment. I don't see it happening. I don't expect that to happen because last year, when Christmas came and went, it didn't happen then. Nor did it happen the year before that or the year before that. We have been reliving this season of Advent, of awaiting the Messiah's coming, and moving into the season of Christmas and celebrating the Messiah's arrival for the last 2,000 years. Emmanuel, God with us, has already come 2,000 years ago. And in all that time, the promise of peace on earth has not been fulfilled. And in that sense, the season of Advent makes no sense at all. Because every year we await the coming of the Messiah, and then we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, and the world seems to be just as messed up today as it was 2,000 years ago. What gives? Clearly this prediction, this prophecy that one day peace and goodwill shall come to the earth, that swords will be beaten into plowshares, and that human beings will study war no longer, it hasn't come true yet. Or has it? Or has it? You know, in our small group Bible studies, we have been reading the book of Acts. And if you read the book of Acts, it's a great book, whether or not you're a part of our small group Bible study, I encourage you to read the book of Acts sometime. But if you read 
the book of Acts, or if you have read the book of Acts, you might be surprised to discover just how radical the early Christian church was. I mean, although the rest of the world might not have exchanged their swords for plowshares, those first followers of Jesus sure did. They refused to participate in violence of any kind. In fact, most people don't realize that's one of the biggest reasons why they were persecuted so heavily by Rome, because they refused to be drafted into the Roman army, to be used to, as instruments of conquest on behalf of Caesar. And not only that, not only did they refuse to participate in acts of violence, but those first followers of Jesus sold everything that they had and shared it equally with one another so that no one among them experienced poverty. And in our Bible study, we have discussed how that seemed really radical to us. But the thing is, sisters and brothers, they believed that they were living in the last days. They believed that any day now, Jesus was going to come again and set everything right. And so those early Christians lived so generously because they truly believed that they didn't have to worry about tomorrow. I mean, after all, it's easy to give away all of your possessions if you think that Christ is coming back before you reach retirement. Right? It's easy to lay down your life to the Roman authorities if you believe that God's just going to raise you back up again in a few weeks. Of course, as time went on and Jesus didn't come again, and most of the world kept on going the way that it had always kept on going, the church became much less radical. I mean, Christians still value peace. But we no longer insist on a commitment to radical nonviolence. We still value charity. And I'm not going to get up here and tell you to sell everything that you've got. I'd probably be out of a job if I did. <laughs> and the promise of Isaiah and the promises of all those other prophets, well, those became promises for another day, another time, and another people. What if those first Christians had it right? Not about the timing of the second coming of Christ and a worldwide fulfillment, a worldwide fulfillment of those promises and prophecies, but what if they were right in living their lives as though they were living in the last days? What if they were on to something when they acted like they didn't have to worry about tomorrow, but only about being faithful to God? Maybe that's what Jesus was getting at when he told his disciples, Therefore, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. That no matter when, no matter even if God ever decides to step in and straighten out our entire world, that we Christians are supposed to be living like it's going to happen tomorrow. So on this first Sunday of Advent, on the Sunday of hope, the question that faces us is this. What fundamentally is hope about, and where fundamentally does hope take place? When does hope take place? Is it something that takes place and finds its fulfillment primarily in the future? I don't think so. I think hope finds its deepest fulfillment in the present. I think that it is our hope in God, our hope for a better tomorrow, which sets us free to live fearlessly today. You know, in Christian theology, we often talk about the kingdom of God in terms of the already and the not yet. Which is a way of saying that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God has broken into our world and is in our world even now, even if it has not yet completely filled every corner of our world. You and I, as Christ's disciples, we are set free from sin and liberated 
to follow Christ's example and live as though the kingdom of God were among us here and now, even though there are still so many places in our world where the kingdom of God has not yet come and God's will is not yet done. Not only are we free to live into that kingdom today, but as Christ's disciples, we are called to carry the light of that kingdom to those who still sit in darkness. That is what Advent hope brings us. The freedom to set down our weapons and to stop studying war, even though we know that there are still very real dangers in our world today. The promise of Isaiah comes true for us when we claim it and act on it and live it out in our world. It is because the Prince of Peace has already come that we can hope that one day nations will not study war anymore. It is because God has come and lived among us in the flesh and dwelt among us that we can hope that God will inhabit our flesh and live in us and work through us. It is because of Emmanuel that we have hope. Not hope, but belief that God is still with us, right here and right now. The prophet Isaiah sets this vision before us, this vision of perfect peace, of weapons of death being transformed into instruments that nourish life, and the ways of war being forgotten. Jesus Christ has inspired us to believe in that vision and to act on that vision and then to steward that vision into the world. The light of Advent shines in the darkness. The light of Christ continues to shine in this war-weary world. And the darkness does not overcome.